So we start with the gospel for this coming Sunday, which I'll read three times and reflect on whatever hits you in this gospel. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had, they had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While well, he was in Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture Zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years. You will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. At this, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well.
Was it common practice for them to have like a marketplace there? I mean, you hear about it in towns where they'll set up marketplaces and we still have the farmers markets and stuff around here. But to have it at the temple just seems. Well, this was not really a marketplace. Um, <clears throat> the temple is where people came to offer sacrifice and the animals being sold were the animals that would be used in the sacrifice. Okay, so, so like in the story of the presentation of Jesus or um, Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple and offer um, a, a sacrifice of, uh, I think it was pigeons or doves, I'm not for sure. Well, you wouldn't bring those animals with you. You would come to the temple area and you would buy the animals that you were going to sacrifice. So that's why there were people there selling animals. And the money changers, you could not use Roman coins in the temple area. So the money changers were outside of the temple gates where you could exchange your Roman coins for uh, uh, Jewish coins so that you were not uh, violating the temple by bringing Roman coins into it mm. to purchase animals for your sacrifice. Anything they sacrificed had to be clean. Yep. part where he um, tells them he'll build it in three days. The double meaning, we had a lot of that in, in our lesson. Mm -hmm. Sure, nobody else got that, but the disciples afterwards. But yet, that gave the disciples something to bring forth in their sermons and stuff. It's it kind of he rose from the dead in three days, just like he said he would. You know. He talks about being human, and that too played in here. He was frustrated because they weren't getting it. <laughs> His closest followers didn't always get it. Well, at one point, it was, I mean, when once the temple was originally built, they had the process going, but what happened along the way, were the money, people after the money and not abiding by what it was meant to be set up with sacrifice and that, because they did offer sacrifices, but this was beyond sacrifice, correct? I mean... I mean, it was going, money was going in the wrong hands, not to the pool or whatever, you know, but I have to share something with you. The last couple of days going by are groundbreaking when we're talking about building something so quickly. I went by today, my, my jaw dropped. I could not believe how things can be built. I mean, open it looks. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I was impressed. I mean, the trucks and everything is just like, yeah. I I kind of, I didn't have a place to park because I thought I'm gonna watch this and see. How this <laughs> yeah, they, they don't want anybody on the property because of how dangerous their equipment yeah. is. Yeah. Oh, I can I can imagine. So even Gary that had to be up there yesterday to meet him to let him know exactly what trees, and what all the different uh, uh, stakes were up, what they all meant. Yeah. He had to park off the um, for the entrance drive is up over there to stay there and couldn't it's just all yeah. open it's just I think it's been such a mild winter that the progress is I mean just driving past the waterworks back you know on this street mm -hmm. is like whoa yeah what was the <clears throat> original covenant of the old testament Love one another, but that's not the original. Uh, well, the covenant was with who? Or between whom? God and the Jews? And, Hebrews? And how would the Hebrew people 
show their love for God, their dedication to God, their belief in God. Their sacrifices. What's the new covenant? Jesus. And what was his sacrifice? His life. So this story, even though it appears in all the Gospels, is maybe a symbolic story to show that the sacrifice of Jesus replaces the sacrifice that the old covenant, or the first covenant, calls mm -hmm. for. There's no longer a need to sacrifice. Jesus has sacrificed his life for us. Also, is it... So he was kind of upset, not because of maybe the marketplace, but because people weren't understanding that they didn't need to do that anymore because he was there and going to be sacrificing himself? The attitude that Jesus had, um, it's hard to say whether that was really factual or that's how the gospel writers put it in there. Um, so he might not have been angry the way this makes it sound. It was it was more, um, did this even really happen? And it might be just a story that was told that the sacrifice of Jesus replaced the, um, the first covenant requirement for sacrifices. So if it's no longer required, you don't need the uh, people selling the animals. You don't need the money changers. Which fits into John's way of telling his part of the stories. He's got the dualism there. He's got sarcasm in there. He's got a lot of the same features in that story that he has in his whole gospel. So that's that's interesting. Mm -hmm. How far, how far after Abraham was tested did this? take place the time of abraham is roughly 1800 bc mm -hmm. um, and this would have been in the early um, 20s so a lot of time yeah okay. and depending upon exactly when jesus was really born and when the historical stuff that's in there as to who was ruling where and that sort of stuff is they figure it's probably around what we would refer to 6 BC as the, the year of Jesus' birth, not the year zero, as um, mm -hmm. we commonly had, had put it. So if he was born around the year six, um, it would have been somewhere in the year, okay. years of the 20s that this only happened. Well, well, more than 1,800 years after Abraham was, as we heard last week's readings, um, asked to sacrifice his son, but, but then his son was spared. But then in the next reading, but was, then he, want, he God offered did a not, holocaust. Yeah. God did not um, withhold his own son, and his own son was sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move into the uh, passages for tonight. And we're going to be looking at two different gospel passages, both of which refer to two sisters named Martha and Mary. And on page 64 of the commentary, it says, it is unclear whether Luke's Mary and Martha are the same people as John's Mary and Martha. And then it talks a little bit about three different gospel passages that refer to um, the uh, one who washed and anointed Jesus' feet at the banquet. And then it's in the three gospels, it's three different people. It's not the same one. So <clears throat> passage goes on these women have often been collapsed into the story of the woman who washes and anoints jesus feet at the banquet the story of a woman who anoints jesus head in preparation for his burial and even the story of mary magdalene 
Unfortunately, the tradition also misidentifies mis Mary and Martha as repentant sinners. So as we look at this tonight, we're, we're not sure whether we're going to be talking about the Mary and Martha in Luke's gospel and then the Mary and Martha in John's gospel, if they are the same set of sisters or not, and scripture scholars have not been able to answer that question, so we're certainly not going to be able to answer it. <clears throat> um, so as we go through these two different gospel passages, let's try to keep them independent and focus on one set of sisters at a time. So the first one is a story that's in uh, chapter 10 of Luke. Um, so if somebody want to read that for us? So chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Martha and Mary, yep. as they continued their journey, he entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part of it and will not be taken from her. All right, there's some <clears throat> different things going on in that passage. And... One of the first things is where it talks right there in verse 38. Um, he entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. The time of Jesus, who typically would be welcoming someone? The, the male. The head of the male. house would be a male. So right away we've got something different going on here. The fact that uh, it's uh, a female that's welcoming him. And then we've got the two sisters, and what are each of them doing? One is playing the host, and the other is playing the server. Playing the what? So she's serving everybody. She's not listening to what Jesus has to say. So which is which? I think you're using the word mm -hmm. host is um, a, that's confusing a little bit because mm -hmm. the server would sometimes be thought of as the host or the gracious one. Oh. I think that's the, I think I know what you mean, but I think that's where the mix up is. So okay. so which one was doing the serving? Martha. 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 And where was Mary? Sitting down at Jesus' feet. Yeah. And that's typically the position of a student down here at the teacher's feet learning from them. Um, now, do any of you have siblings? <laughs> yes. Were there times where a sibling was upset because they were doing all the work and you were? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Never happened to me because I was the one who was always doing all this. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, Martha. Just don't ask my brother and sister <laughs> to verify that. Yeah, unfortunately, when you have siblings so spread out, like in my family, you're still hearing what they went through, and we had no idea how much they did. Oh. And they left the house, and there was just me and my younger sister out of six girls doing wow. the same thing that they did. We never even gave it a thought, but to this day, we still hear. <laughs> what? <laughs> you just never knew how much we had on our hands. Well, they had to take care of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, keeping my mouth closed? Yeah. <laughs> so what do we make of um, when, when Martha comes to Jesus to complain, you know, make my sister come and help me. What do, you, what do we make of the response that Jesus has? 
but he, I think he's kind of tough on her, really, you know, and I mean, she was doing the most important thing, really, but I think that, you know, Martha was, Martha was just being human, I think, and Mary maybe had a little bit more perception. Well, in part, there's no male present to be the host, to use your word. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think in a way, Martha felt like she needed to make sure there were still um, food and, 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 and drink for them. And, uh, and yet, he, that wasn't what he was, he didn't feel that was the, mo the more important part. Kind of like Lent now. You're you're supposed to, you know, do do these things in order to become closer to Jesus, rather than trying to get credits per se. You know, <laughs> and Martha wants to be recognized for her works, but but Mary is there actually getting closer to Jesus, like directly. Distracted mm -hmm. mainly is what happened with her. Mm -hmm. which we kind of reflects on us too you know we get distracted and we forget our faith and time for prayer and everything because everything else is more important to us i'm guilty of being both of them <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sure jesus appreciated what both were doing but oh, that focus what's more important is the listening to the word of god but you know just and uh, I'm surprised that Mary came or Martha came forward. But you don't know the tone. You don't know how to interpret things. Um, how Jesus is going to react? It, it, going through this this session of uh, our study, so many things it, you could be interpreted in many ways. Mm -hmm. And um, Jesus would always recognize, you know, what they did. After all, I mean, if there was no food and you know especially for the men no food and anything to drink and whatever my gosh how would that go over um but it was important uh, when we talk about hospitality the importance of doing that and we all grown up with that how, how we have our own way of doing things and I remember my neighbor would always give me tea and toast when I would pull mm -hmm. the weeds in the yard mm -hmm. always gave me tea and toast and that sounds like nothing but I thought that was pretty exciting. <laughs> I think Mary was the older one and Martha was the little sister. Okay, yeah, you really get that in me. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I think it kind of represents in a way our inner struggle ourself because we probably would have been doing, doing what Martha wanted, but wanting to do what Mary did. I struggle with that a lot. This is what I want to do, but this is what I feel I have to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't see either one as being really wrong right. for what they exactly. did. But yet, that's what, I mean, I kept looking at it and it's like, I felt sorry for Martha. But it's like, man, I would have liked to have done what Mary did too. I mean, so it's kind of like an inner struggle for me, representation of that. So, But what was interesting is the conversation with Jesus and what, how they you know, the verbiage that they shared together between Jesus and both of them. I think that that, that really kind of took care of everything for them to understand and hear, even though she came and said, you know, how come I cannot get some help on that? But, you know, that's what conversations are good for, you know, when you have conflict to do. <laughs> um, who's going to go up against Jesus? You know, or... <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> But it doesn't really go on to say, you know, oh, Martha took it with a good spirit. I mean, you know, I mean, if I might have been Martha, you know, trying to be responsible and take care of things. And um, I might have said things like Martha said. And then I, I think I would have been so embarrassed if Jesus had said that to me. You know, I just kind of go, oh. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> never gave that a You put it well, Sue. <laughs> yeah. Well, so 
anyway, I think he, he was kind of tough on her, but he put it he put her in the right direction. And that I think is what we need to know and follow through on. I've heard in other areas where he says not to worry, right? And then and in other areas it says like to act more childlike. And that makes sort of sense that Mary was the younger, so more childlike and just taking it in. And Martha was trying to more control things instead of surrendering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else on Luke's Martha and Mary? Let's move to John's gospel. Basically, all of chapter 11, but we won't read that because we're just going to take sections of it at a time. But in the commentary on page 67, right in the middle of that first column, John's gospel contains seven miracle stories, which the gospel writer calls signs. Seven is a symbolic number representing fullness or perfection. And we should think of the author's signs as pointing towards something. The raising of Lazarus is the seventh and last sign of this gospel. The author of the gospel uses it to confirm the religious authorities' resolve to arrest Jesus and put him to death. But what do you make of what's referred to as the book of signs in John's gospel? It says that there were seven of those, and the last, the seventh, was the raising of Lazarus. What's the symbolism that you see there? What's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> the Book of Signs and John, John's Gospel is uh, one of the main miracles that John identifies. <clears throat> And this commentary talks about that there were seven of them, and what the symbolic meaning of seven is, and that the raising of Lazarus was the seventh of the seven signs. So, what do you make of that story as being the seventh sign? Well, it kind of refers back to almost says Jesus raised. Lazarus up and it was after what was it four days later so after he was what they classified as truly the spirit being gone and everything and Jesus was rose from the dead three days later so it's kind of like a repeat of what was going to happen in his life so he started out raising somebody else but then he rose himself from the dead four days three days but So that, I'm sorry. No, go, no, go ahead. I was going to say, so that was the last of the seven. Would that be the end of uh, the ministry of Jesus? Because that comes, then his death comes soon, soon after that. Yeah, because these chapters come, um, <clears throat> well, this is chapter 11 and chapter 12. We look at the first part of that, but the rest of chapter 12 is the Last Supper discourse in John's Gospel. Mm -hmm. So the, these stories are what just immediately precede um, mm -hmm. The Last Supper. Is it a sign of the uh, Jesus talking about in the end, we will all be, you know, resurrected, uh, you know, because he was going to bring Lazarus back to life, but Re Lazarus was still going to die again. I mean, so that, you know, Lazarus was not done. I mean, he was still going to end up dying. But if, if this is number seven and we're looking at perfection, you know, for the end for us then, striving for discipleship or, you know, perfection will be at the time of the resurrection. I mean, our own dying. So maybe that's, I mean, that's what I would see if, if we're talking that this is number seven.
Was the reason why he was arrested was because it was done on a Sunday? Well, that's um, one I can't remember. Not this one, but okay. the, um, other miracles. He was criticized because he was mm -hmm. uh, healing on the Sabbath, which is considered work, Sabbath. and you were to do no work on on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, especially in the Synoptic Gospels, there's numerous reference to the Pharisees criticizing either Jesus or the uh, disciples for doing things on the Sabbath that. Uh, yeah, what was the role of the um, the Jewish leaders? Was they were the healers, not Jesus. So when Jesus does this, I think that's why they're going to kill him because they, this is about it. This is they've had it with them now, and I think that's you know. He's, he's disrupted their authority enough and they figure if he does this, he brings Lazarus back and all these people are watching this and they're all going to follow him now, then that's the end. You know, so at least that, that's kind of what spoke to me about this. Okay, so when we look at <clears throat> chapter 11 of John, in Luke's gospel, we, we mentioned that it was um, the village of, of Martha, and she went out to uh, welcome him or greet him, which typically would be a male responsibility. So verse 1 here, now a man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So here we do have a male mentioned, but it's the village of the two sisters. So again, in a paternalistic society, how do you see that way of uh, identifying where this took place? Well, Lazarus was the head of the house, and they all lived together, it sounds like. So. But it's the village of Martha Mary. and Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, they must have had some status in in their society. I think, according to the off, you know, the the woman at Kathy Corey who's writing this, because they would not have mentioned them as first, because normally it would have been Lazarus, and yet here the two women are met and mentioned first. I also got the fact that the writer wanted this story to be focused on them, their meaning, what what they brought to the story. Um, it wasn't all about Lazarus being dying and being rose as much as it was their role and everything is what I was getting out of the story itself, that we really were supposed to be focusing on that part of it. Focus on what part of it? That it, the story was about Mary and Martha, not about oh. Lazarus so much. Oh, on the bottom of page 67, it, said, it states that um, this emphasis on Mary and Martha over Lazarus may indicate that these two women were of higher social status mm -hmm. in the community than their brother, or that they were well respected in the village. Narrator explains that Jesus loved all three, Mary, um, Martha, Mary, and that Jesus loved all three, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, but notice the order in which they are named. Okay, Randy, why? <laughs> Excuse me, Deacon Randy, why? You think they were maybe, or one, one of them, maybe, uh... The first, uh, Martha was a widow, and he seems to you know, care for widows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that's in the commentary that that might be the case. But, uh, and as there is with so many of these passages, we're not given a lot of background or details. It's a um, story being told, and we got these characters that suddenly appear in the story. The story ends, and that's the end of hearing about those people. So it's kind of, they're being used by the gospel writer to help make a point about Jesus. And 
what is the point that he's trying to make. So it's not, the story is not so much about Lazarus or Martha and Mary. The story is really about Jesus. Uh, and again, John's whole intent in his gospel was to show that Jesus truly was God. Mm -hmm. So what in here would, in this whole passage shows that Jesus is, Jesus is God? Well, I thought oh, most of this was about the fact that he delayed in getting there so that it made so that it was obvious that this man had passed and he raised him from the dead and that was his that was his being god i mean i maybe mary and martha are important in there but to me it, I thought it had a lot to do with the fact that Jesus could do that. And that's what made it so remarkable. Yeah, and how many days was Lazarus in the tomb? Four. 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 Yeah, as Karen mentioned, Jewish yeah. understanding was that the spirit or soul left the body after three days. So it's like, yeah, he's truly dead. So that's why he had to wait to give him time mm -hmm. to yes. get to that point yes. after death. So that it could be a miracle being performed. Mm -hmm. Well, on the other hand, too, if he was ill and sick, he, he wouldn't have gotten the... Um, the belief as much as you would raising if he was dead versus visiting him and curing him Here, from yeah. being sick. Mm -hmm. it, it would just be nothing. Just like every, everybody gets sick. Whatever. But he did. But it's, it, uh, it's also interesting that, you know, Mary and Martha understood Jesus more than the apostles. I think that's in the commentary in that He's really calling them to discipleship, too. That's why he wanted, you know, Martha to, you know, not not embarrass her, but to call her to say, you are need to be a disciple rather than just running around, you know. And, and hospitality was important, but more important was her call to discipleship along with Mary. And I think there, that to me, that's one of the strong points of the gospel, too. Not, I mean, of the... Yeah the gospel of not only Jesus showing that he is, you know, God, but that he's also calling us to a discipleship. We're going to get into, after this raising of Lazarus in chapter 12, we're going to get into um, the anointing of Jesus. But verse 2 here says, Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. He's her brother Lazarus who was ill. So what do you make of that where here it says, Mary is the one who had anointed Jesus. But in the story here, it comes after this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no chronology in the scriptures. Well, <laughs> there well, isn't. I mean, you if you try to follow all the chronology, it doesn't fit. So, I mean, that's part of it. You can't make it fit. <laughs> but you may want it to fit here. But I, you know, I, I think they're all kind of individual. Because it could have happened before and they just put it. I mean, when even Jesus' trip to Capernaum, I mean, the way that they talk about it, it doesn't always work. You know. You don't want them to give up the ending, <laughs> the good ending. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So Jesus hears <clears throat> Lazarus is sick, and as Claudia had mentioned, um, he dilly dallies for a couple of days before he even sets out to um, go to meet. Lazarus, whatever is going on with him. But somehow, as Jesus is approaching, Martha 
goes out to meet him. We have no idea again how she knew that Jesus was approaching or where to go to meet him. But what does Martha greet Jesus with? How come you're late? <laughs> <laughs> Why weren't you here? What's the matter? <laughs> well, what's the exact words that she uses? Hmm. And here he would not have died. Right. And then after Jesus has a discussion with her, then Martha sends word to Mary that the master is here and he's looking for you. So she comes out and how does she greet Jesus? Same, same, same. So what do you make of that, that both sisters approach Jesus independently, but each greet him with that same statement? They're hurting. They lost their brother. And Jesus was his friend. And he didn't show up. <laughs> and he could have. It was only two miles. <laughs> yeah. I could walk. <laughs> no, no. I'm not like, comparing myself to Jesus. <laughs> it's almost Good. like their Good. faith was like I had yeah. faith that you could heal him, but never ever thought that he could raise him from the dead. Right. You know what I mean? They just didn't go that, that far. That, yeah. I mean, it it shows how much faith they had that he could heal. But but not faith enough to raise him. <laughs> yeah. So the conversation before Mary comes out, what what is Jesus actually saying to Martha? He's not really he's okay. He, just he said he'll he rise. He's gonna rise. He's all right. And he's what's her response? I know it. He's <laughs> dense. <laughs> And she, he just says, do you believe that he will rise? And she says, I do. You're the Messiah, the son of God, which the apostles had a hard time saying, the one who was coming into the world. I was surprised when it said that he, she said that he would be resurrected because they didn't, they didn't believe him. Right. When you died, you died. It seemed like well, then. No, at the time of Jesus, the, the Sadducees still did not believe in life after okay. death. Uh, but but other, most of the other Jews did. did. Okay. So when she responds that, you know, I know he'll rise on the resurrection on the last day. Um, she's referring to a resurrection different than what Jesus intends to do here. He's, Jesus is not on cons not not concerned that Lazarus died because he knows mm -hmm. he knows the chronological order of things. That are right. <laughs> <laughs> but he does. There's a part in there where he does thank God for granting his um, petition to raise him. I. I yeah, I remember that too. Mm -hmm. I caught something in there yeah. where in the, where Jesus thanks God for granting him the ability ability to raise Lazarus. Lazarus. Oh. You know, but he did care. I mean, he said, you know, Jesus wept. So I mean there's yeah, he did care, it's but the I tension. Because he knew. Where is that one you said you saw? Yeah, I can't remember, but I know I saw something in here. Yeah, 41. Well, I know. Oh, you found 40, 41? Yeah. 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 Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. So did you. Mm -hmm. Is it in chapter 14? 11. For, 40, um, 1141. 1141. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. 
that yeah. they may believe that you sent me. So again, going back to the first we talked about in John's Gospel, this is the seventh of the seven signs. It's the last action that he's doing to really show that he truly is from the Father and is the Son and is God, which again is the whole point of John's Gospel. Can you say more about the numbers? Well, in numerology, uh, different numbers have different meanings. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see um, certain numbers repeated several times. Um, so seven, in chapter one of Genesis, the creation story. Seven days of the week. Yeah, so creation takes how long? Seven days. Well, six days and then no, the seventh so. day, it he was complete. It. it was done. Okay. Everything, everything was perfect. So that's um, the, the seven that we see there. Um, the uh, if seven is complete, what would be considered incomplete? Six. Anything else? You've got to do fractions. Oh, fractions! <laughs> fractions. Here goes math. <laughs> Three and a half. So you, there's certain passages where it talks about three and a half years, um, and those passages are referring to that that's um, showing incomplete or lack of perfection. Um, the number um, twelve. How many tribes of Israel? Twelve. Were there? twelve. How many? Were there? Twelve. Oh. Um, and. Um, the uh, number 40, how often do you hear about 40? 40 days in the wilderness. Uh, 40 years, 40, years 40 days of Jesus' 40. temptation, yeah. uh, 40 years in the desert, and 40 days of the flood. Mm -hmm. um, so numerous references to 40. So a lot of these are not actual Factual numbers, they're numbers because of the symbolism of what that number stands for. Um, and a thousand is basically considered infinity uh, or innumerable. So in the book of Revelation, when you've got the 144,000 that are washed in the, the blood of the Lamb in their white robes, well, there's only 144,000 people in heaven. Your chances aren't very good because I know I'm going to be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but again, that's, Show next to you, right? that's, that's a symbolic number. So um, if, if you take all the people of the Old Testament that can be um, symbolized by the tribes of the Hebrew people, mm -hmm. what number do you have? It's 12. Okay, and if you take all the people of the New Testament symbolized by the apostles, what number 12. do you have? Yeah. So what's 12 times 12? So if you take all the people of the Old Testament and all the people of the New Testament, you got 144. If a thousand is infinity, mm -hmm. what's 144 times a thousand? Infinity. No, in actual numbers. Oh, mm -hmm. My calculator now. 144,000. Yeah. yeah. So that, that number is not, again, a factual number of mm -hmm. how many people the, the writer of Revelation sees in, in heaven. It's the idea that all people of all time, because of what Jesus did for us, can be in heaven. Um, you see, in the Old Testament, people living to unreal ages. Um, Moses supposedly died at the age of 120. Going back to 40, there's 40 years that he mm -hmm. lived in um, 
Egypt uh, when Pharaoh's daughter rescued him from the Nile. Mm -hmm. Then when he um, kills one of the Egyptians and is found out, he escapes, mm -hmm. goes lives in the land of Midian for 40 years. And then he comes back to the command of Yahweh to free the people. And then 40 years in the wilderness leading into the promised land. So it's those three 40 year spans that are the life of Moses that comes up with that age of 120. Moses did not live to be 120, but again, it's a symbolic um, age. And 120 is used frequently in the Old Testament to show this was a good person because as Karen mentioned before, there was a time period um, where no one believed in life after death. It was when you were dead, you were dead. That's mm -hmm. it. So you were either rewarded or punished in this life um, because there was not going to be a reward or punishment later. Mm -hmm. You weren't going to be anything. Mm -hmm. um, you were just rotting in the soil or ashes of uh, as cremation was being done. But um, that idea that um, you're rewarded for living a good life means that you live to an old age. So you put a large age on those people. Um, you've got sons because your name lives on through your sons. So you've got a lot of sons. Um, you're rewarded with property, possessions. So like in the book of Job, where Job seems to have everything and then all of a sudden loses it all. And his friends are, okay, what did you do wrong? Where, where did you sin? Because you've, you're have you being punished now. You must have done something wrong. Um, because that was the idea then, is that um, it was, still is for some. this was it. <laughs> there was nothing coming later. Um, so those, those ages were often, uh, again, symbolic to try to show that this was a good person that was being rewarded with a long life, being rewarded with sons, being rewarded mm -hmm. with property. Thank you. So how does Jesus actually go about raising Lazarus? What happens? Awesome. He tells them to roll away the stone. And Martha complains that because he's been there for several days, that the stench would be horrific. And Jesus tells him to do it anyway. And then he asks God to raise him and um, tells him to take off the grave clothes. Well, what, what does he say first? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, come out. Father, I thank you. No, no, after that. After that. I knew you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And they said, Lazarus, come out. So you get his command to Lazarus after the stone is rolled back to come out. Mm -hmm. What does Lazarus do? No. So how does he get out? Well, he's all it's all bound what? up. He's all bound up. And, right. Yeah, because that next and, passage says bound hand and foot. So yeah. he probably didn't walk out. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe he crawled out. Or that what? Crawled. Or <laughs> he well, they were supposed to take off the bandages at one point. Yeah, yeah. So then they to unbind him. So he's yep. out when right. he comes out. So how does he come out? It's not and, described anywhere. We don't know. But oh, we don't know. No. Nope. That was a trick question. Watch for a good one. Yeah. <laughs> but a good one. So then after this miracle happens, 
what do the uh, Jewish leaders, how do they react? Oh, they well, did. they say they just as soon have one guy die <laughs> than lose their whole congregation. So Jesus is going to be sacrificed because this is too much for them. It, he says, you know, that uh, one man should die instead of the people so that whole nation may not perish. That's what they saw. Yeah, so it's Caiaphas, the, the high priest, that's saying yeah. that. So then when we get to the passion story and Jesus is brought before the Sanhedrin, we're reminded of what Caiaphas says here. And the idea is um, let's not have the Romans uh, persecute all of us. Let's sacrifice this one individual. Uh, it's better that he die than, than all of us. But what he's actually predicting is exactly what happened. Jesus dies, but dies for all of us. So he doesn't even realize what he's saying, but he's saying exactly what Jesus was all about and why he was there. And then we move into the first part of um, chapter 12. And that's that um, in 19. I'm just before the Passover. And Lazarus has been raised, and they're gathered for dinner. So at the time of Jesus, when you came into somebody's house for dinner, what would normally happen at the doorway? Take off your sandal and clean your feet. Well, who would clean your feet? The servants. Okay. So what happens in this story? Mary, Mary does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She takes the expensive um, perfume and cleans, cleans, washes his feet and dries them with her hair. So much so that the fragrance filled the room, the house, the whole house. And in the commentary, it refers to another foot washing. What's that one? Last Supper. Oh, Last Supper. And who is washing feet there? Jesus. Jesus. And washing whose feet? That's and what does Jesus dry their feet with? Towel. I thought he had a towel that he put around his waist. Yeah, he had a towel around his waist. What is Mary drying Jesus' feet with? Her hair. Her hair. What's a more personal touch? Well, <laughs> yeah. So I don't she, think any of us could do washing. <laughs> I certainly couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Feet would be pretty wet. <laughs> um, yeah, Father Paul's got more hair than I do, so maybe it's only Thursday we should have him dry feet with his hair. Feet with his hair and... I'm going to tell him he said that. <laughs> <laughs> but what Jesus is doing at that Last Supper, he's saying, What I have done for you, you should do for one another, showing him that uh, sign of being a servant leader not right. um, expecting others to serve you you serve others which is exactly what mary had done just prior to that washing of the uh, disciples feet at the last supper so as mary is doing this and putting what would be very expensive perfumed oil in a large <laughs> liter of perfumed oil who complains? Judas. Judas. Oh, what's behind that? Money. <laughs> Greed. Greed. They really didn't care about the poor. Yeah, so yeah, why did somebody just read that whole passage of Judas's reaction there?
So it'll be chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, and then going through uh, 8. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and would help himself from it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep what she has for the day of my burial. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. So what do we get out of that exchange there? I think Jesus knew what she was up to all along. He would know. Yeah. He would know. That was part of the master plan, though. So you kind of just let that part happen, I guess. Because it had to progress to it. Judas betraying him. So we get the reaction of, of Judas here, more referring to the uh, quantity and <clears throat> value of <clears throat> the um, perfumed oil, <clears throat> perfumed oil that uh, Mary used. But that idea that a servant is the one who typically would be washing the feet of the guests, and here's Mary at reclining at the table with them, and then all of a sudden gets up and go washes Jesus' feet. I think the reaction would have been from the rest of those around the table. And since it wasn't a, well, it was a tradition that they kept their hair covered and stuff, that would have been even more shocking that she actually took her hair down in front of somebody because that was reserved for in private with the husband only. Mm -hmm. Well, it even says she took the position of a slave in order mm -hmm. to do this. Maybe, well, maybe some of them were feeling like she's showing us up, or you know, or like you know, she's mm -hmm. going too far, and mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're feeling self conscious about you know mm -hmm. they know him even better, and they're not they're not uh, treating him the way that maybe he should be, or the reverence he mm -hmm. should have. Which they were not to do to outshine them and mm -hmm. that. Um, so when it's mentioned um, about, he said, you know, let her keep, um, what was it, for the anointing. That must have been a regular process for the dead to be anointed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, if you go uh, <clears throat> into the, uh, in, in Jerusalem, if you go to the, um, it's like of the uh, resurrection. Um, you go up some steps, and there's a hole there at the top of the steps where this is um, Calvary. This is where Jesus' cross was. And then you go down to a small church that's um, inside this huge church. And in there is what is supposedly the actual grave that Jesus was placed in. Um, so you can go into this little church and see the slab where he was actually laid. But between the two, there's another slab, and that's where the body would have been laid for that anointing and then the wrapping um, with the burial cloths. Mm -hmm. Now, whether any or all of these are authentic, it's just like most of the stuff in the Holy Land, it's you know, this supposedly is where this took place but uh, most christians look at that little church within the uh, church of the holy sepulcher that this is where jesus was really buried but there's some other christians that have the garden grave that's outside mm -hmm. and that's where jesus was buried mm -hmm. and just like uh, where john baptized jesus there's different places along the Jordan where people claim this is where it took place. There was not somebody there taking pictures so we can show this is exactly where it happened, but 
it, it's more the idea that somewhere here these things really took place mm -hmm. and it's uh, it this exact spot or a different spot is immaterial as to what what really happened either here or mm -hmm. some someplace close by. When they take you to those sites, do they say it that honestly? I mean, what, when you're touring and and you go to those places, do they say this is possibly? Depends on who your tour guide is. Yeah. Oh, because it's believed the, to be. <laughs> yeah, the two times that we've been there, um, we went to the tomb, the holy or the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, mm -hmm. and went to the, the tomb um, when. My mother and father-in-law went there. They were with a different group, with them being a Methodist minister. Mm -hmm. They didn't go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. They went to the Garden Tomb, and that's mm -hmm. where Jesus was buried. So, okay, so uh, it depends on who takes you. And, yeah. Okay. And, and some will say, this is the spot where this <laughs> happened, and other guides might say, um, it was this spot or a spot like this. So okay. Okay. You're, you're kind of at the mercy of the guide as to what interpretation you get. Okay. Um, so a really good guide will um, take you to a spot, read from one of the Gospels what supposedly was happening there so you can focus again more on the story than on the actual yeah. location. Okay. So it's not important whether this is the right spot or not, but what's important is the story that the spot tells us. Yeah. Okay. As we started out, we talked about that Luke has a story of Martha and Mary, and John has a story of Martha and Mary, and we don't know whether they're the same Martha and Mary or different ones or even if their names really were Martha and Mary. Um, there's a lot of confusion that comes about as people um, look at different passages, draw different conclusions from them, and stories start getting mixed together. So on uh, page 74 there in that first column, it says, in the history of biblical interpretation, as early as the sixth century, the stories of several women, this Mary, the sister of Martha of Bethany, an unnamed woman who anoints Jesus in Luke and Mary Magdalene get collapsed into one story. But in fact, the Gospels present these women as separate characters, and only the unnamed woman and woman in Luke is identified as a sinner. So um, we have the same story told three different times with three different people being the ones that... Um, washed and anointed the feet of Jesus. Um, but they kind of get mixed together and people um, take them as, as one story. And that's why you'll sometimes hear Mary Magdalene referred to as a prostitute or as a sinner that Jesus um, forgave. Um, and that's because in Luke's gospel, it's a woman who is a sinner that washed and anointed Jesus' feet, but that woman was not Mary Magdalene in, in Luke's gospel. Was Mary Magdalene a sinner? Was she a prostitute? No. No. Okay. Well, to answer your first question, she is a sinner. She, is, she was not Jesus, and she was not... right. Or his mother, she was probably a sinner, because we all are. Right. right. Okay. okay, because that, correct me if I'm wrong, Mary Magdalene, and I know you don't like the chosen. I mean, I know you think that it's kind of, kind of fictionalized and whatever. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, it, it has brought me closer to this, to the Bible. And um, Mary Magdalene, Correct me if I'm wrong. She was. In, I think in the beginning. Yes, a yeah. prostitute. No. And, no. That, okay, I heard it. That, that, <laughs> no. Exactly why I do not watch programs. Okay. Right. Fictitious. Yeah. Okay. Because they totally Randy. 
Well, okay. I'm not going to argue with the biblical guy. Let's, let's be thankful that it has brought Sue closer to the Bible. Yeah. It has definitely brought me closer. I mean, yes. It, it, it makes you go look things up. It does. Um, I mean, okay. because the Bible is not factual. Right. There. That's all I have to say. <laughs> okay. But you know, it has been the tradition of the church. They really have passed on Mary Magdalene as the prostitute. So that, you know, I can see why the chosen would pick that up because that's what people thought for years because of the stories getting so mixed up. So now they, you know, the women have done their own research and, you know, and now we have a special, you know, feast for Mary Magdalene to clarify that she was the apostle to the apostles not this prostitute oh okay thank you there okay. could have been a, yeah. a, a more than one mary Magdalene, but i mean i go all the way back to watching um jesus christ superstar in my teens uh -huh. and uh i still got the record and listened to that so yeah <laughs> yeah well it yeah okay and i think that's good information because i, I really didn't know that and um, so us, you know, us people who born and raised Catholic go to all this Catholic education and don't know this stuff, don't know factual information is just sad, really. But here I am. So that's good. That's why we have Bible study. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the main thing, too, is we are all sinners. Mm -hmm. And if you can pick out what sins everybody, we are all sinners. Yeah. But Jesus is a lot like us, but he's 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 not have sin on his record. But yeah, and, and so many people judge and misunderstand what sin even means. You know, some people just flag themselves off. Well, well that's not so bad. <laughs> well, and, and, and sins of omission and commission. Yes. Oh, you know, and, and I omission. I have to share, I was over at Bob's Produce and Fridley in last Friday. Um, I was looking for some meatless meal, anything that they had. And this woman was there with these little samples and everything had meat in it. And she kept trying to get me to eat it. And I said, no, it's Lent. And I observe. And she says, I can't believe it. I've not heard anybody in a long time that actually observes Lent, even some of the Catholics that I know. And you know what that woman did? She ran over to the meat department and she was, she can't, she found me in the store and it was like cream cheese with lobster in it. Oh, <laughs> I could not believe. She, she, but she person. said, I grew up on you know, 11 kids on the farm. We were Catholic and they adhered real strict. But she said, I didn't think anybody observed Lent anymore. And There's like, a lot of people that do. Yeah, yeah, there are. I eat a lot of baked potatoes and, and, and fish and mm -hmm. eggs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Mac and cheese. Huh? Mac, right. and cheese. mac and cheese. I do not like mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a hot dish. The, uh, oh yeah. The idea of, of <laughs> that is penance, but if Friday is and Lent is supposed to be a day of penance, and okay, I'm not going to eat meat, but I'm going out for a lobster dinner. What kind of penance is that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Depends yeah. where you're going to have a lobster dinner. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. <laughs> the places that have bad lobster. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I, I wasn't raised in a very affluent household. And um, it was an Episcopal household. And we had a calendar. And when it came to Lent, not only the Fridays had a fish on it, but all the Wednesdays. And because we didn't have much money, my mom bought oyster stew. Hate it to this day. Wow. We just got the stew because we didn't like the oysters. My mom and dad got the oysters. <laughs> but that was that was dinner that night on a Friday, Friday or Wednesday night. It was waterly, watery oyster stew wow. and those little oyster crackers. Wow. That, that was dinner. Mm -hmm. But we observed during yeah, Lent, yeah. Wednesday and Friday. Wow. Oh, but, yeah. But back then, it was every Friday, not just the Fridays. Oh, yeah. Vatican II. Right. So yeah. I would always, um, 
They're typical would be sardines or fish sticks. Oh, fish sticks. Oh, I remember those. But um, during Lent, the duckling comes out the first Friday of every month, and then during Lent every Friday. Of, um, the rural church when I was baptized and did a fish fry. And mm. I've got relatives that live up here in the cities that still go up to Lima oh. went oh. with their fish fries because they're mm. so good. But I and can't eat them really anymore the because they're oh. battered. Oh, yeah. right. But right. that's not really the point, though, is it? No. The point is not to enjoy that delicious fish. Mm -hmm. Should eat carp or something oh. else. <laughs> Yikes. But if you don't get creamed by one, <laughs> you're bored. Yeah. Yeah. Jump it up. Oh, I have a question that is, might be off the topic. Raising Lazarus was the seventh sign. Okay. And then some, I was trying to list the signs. Uh, water to wine. Mm -hmm bread and fish to feed the masses, walking on water, and I'm stymied. I put the Annunciation, but that came after Lazarus, oh, so that is carrying one of the signs. When they were fishing in the Sea of Galilee and they weren't getting any fish, and he said, cast your nets on the other side, is that one of them? That's in Luke's Gospel. What about John the Baptist? You know the miracle of, uh, you know, his his you know being born late into Sarah's life. That would be another miracle, I would think. Well, that's, that's it depends on what you define by miracle. Then too, are they all Jesus's miracles, or you know? No, the the seven signs are in in the book of signs in John's gospel. Okay. Uh, John the Baptist's birth is in Luke's gospel. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't really know what the all I, I the was sitting were. here and then I wrote yes yeah. the annunciation. I thought, oh no, that was after right. so it's is I don't know what they are. Okay, so the wedding at Cana. Oh, water to wine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I already got that one. Oh, well, it's one of them curing the blind man to wine. Yeah, the man born blind. That, that, yeah, the blind man blind. Okay. Man. And then the woman was somebody's, I think, daughter or son. Oh, yes. Yeah, the, the, oh, yeah, the, the official son. Now, was the that? second sign was at Cana where he, um, Well, the first one was at Cana. The second one is the royal. Yeah. Or the son. Third son, the paralytic. So, Randy, in yeah. your book, it talks about the seven signs on yeah. 2177. It's third. The paralytic was third. I, I yeah. know. It's at the very so beginning. The, Did you have that? Flows of fish walking on water. Um, oh, Cana was the first one, I think. Right. So water uh, is there, uh, in the commentary and the Man Catholic study line. Bible here, it says, the gospel narrative contains a series of signs, the gospel's word for the wondrous deeds of Jesus. The author is primarily interested in the significance of these deeds and so interprets them for the reader by various reflections, narratives, and discourses. The first sign is the transformation of water into wine at Canaan. Okay. Second sign, the cure of the royal official's son. Mm -hmm. oh. Um, Third sign is the cure of the paralytic. Right. What, yeah. That one, I don't understand what that officials signs. He healed him from afar, like he said. He said, You don't need to come to my yeah, house. Thank you. Royal official son. Okay. What was third? The healing of the paralytic. The paralytic at the pool. Okay. What was that one? That oh, third. yes. And then the multiplication of the loaves and the walking on the water. water. Was there a man born blind or something? When was that? We healed the blind man. The blind man. What number is that? Yeah, that one is. Okay, so it's in. What was the fourth, Mary Jo? What page are you on? What chapter? Right in the fish. Well, this is in the commentary. Oh, so. I'm reading the commentary too, yeah. 
Oh, well, that's where I started should be reading here. some of this. Is this the commentary? Mm -hmm. I don't have a Catholic Bible. I think the commentary is this one, I think. The oh, six young man born blind. What number is that? Six. Six? six yeah. So okay. then seven would be Lazarus. Lazarus. So one, two, three, six, seven. I got seven. I got to figure out what order they're in. Okay. So what's uh, four? The feeding um, of the 5,000. Yeah. Okay. Walking in the water. Oh. What was that? Feeding. In the walking of the water of the Sea of Galilee. That's four. What number is that? Oh, that's maybe five. Walking on water. Well, the multiplication of loaves and walking in the water are four, four, or four and five. Four and five. Okay. Four, five, four, and five. And one minus six and last one. Okay. Walking on the water. Four, 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 is it is it listed in the class mixed up in it? Well, I probably yeah, I don't get in that order. It's it, it's 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 oh, John. All right. There's a little John, title. John, what? John. It's, well, it starts with John. At the beginning? As long as I have a list seven, then I can put it. The wedding of the is John 2. Oh, okay. okay. The official sum is. John four forty three. And then you start talking about the numbers seven and you think of the seven sacraments. You think I I got kind of curious, so I started looking at you know oh, what they all mean and I couldn't I feel not the how many numbers, numbers there are that you said you know in the Bible commentary on those in their Bibles and I have a a different Bible than that. Oh this is the commentary ceiling is a pool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you don't have the, we all have okay. different Bibles. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. And then the order sometimes too can be different. I'll look it up when I get that. I think how they yeah. list them. Which Thank you. Me. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, we talked about two sisters, Martha and Mary, and that both Luke and John's gospel mentioned them, but not knowing whether they're the same Martha and Mary. And on page 75 of the commentary, it shows a chart there of different Marys that are mentioned in the New Testament and who they are, a description of who they were, so this one's just what their name was, or how do we identify them in the second column about what specifically they had done? And then the third column, the scripture passages that refer to so uh, didn't get a chance to look at some of those different passages you might want to take some time to do that so let's quickly look at some of the questions for this week first question luke's story of mary and martha's encounter with jesus at martha's home introduces the theme of hospitality most cultures have rituals around welcoming people into their homes what practices of hospitality do you or your family have when you visit someone who has a distinct practice of hospitality, how does it make you feel? Wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. The coffee pot was always on. Yep. Yep. My mom always made coffee with the egg in it. Oh, yeah. I didn't learn about that till I moved to Minnesota. What was that? <laughs> yeah. I thought my friends were crazy. <laughs> I thought it was a good coffee. coffee. It makes really good <laughs> that coffee. Could be. Just a whole egg? Yeah. A whole egg, yep. <laughs> I've heard of it. I just it kind of makes it real it. clear mm -hmm. when you make the coffee. You always you break it sweet. into the coffee? <laughs> and up into the ground when you had a, like a percolator oh. coffee. Oh, you put it, you crack it open into the grounds? Into the grounds. Oh, and then the whole. At least that's what I oh. how I was taught. And we never had coffee filters back then. It just went into the little mm -hmm. rack. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. 
And being mm -hmm. a non coffee drinker, I'd look at that as a waste of a perfectly good. <laughs> We didn't have an, enough eggs to put them in the pot. <laughs> I got in trouble once. Was, both of my grandmas raised eggs, and that was their spending money because they would sell them. Um, right. Whatever their yeah. extra money was. And my brother and I went, the grandma on my dad's side of the family, we went and got all the eggs out of the chicken coop and went and fed them to the pigs. Oh, here, that's was, what was normal Oops. to do that? No, it was not normal. That's why no. my brother <laughs> got so much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somebody in the company, accompanying him also got in trouble. Yeah. That person will remain named. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he oh, yeah. taught you, right? Yeah, he made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> what are some other things besides the coffee pot I was doing on that we can show is Hospitality. Big cookie jar. I always have to do that. <laughs> I've still got one of my mom's. Like that. She made donuts. Invite, and invite them to come in and sit down. <laughs> mm -hmm. Take the coats, hang them up, because in Minnesota we have heavy coats. <laughs> well, even the milkman that used to walk in the door that, that wasn't locked would come in once in a while and mom would give him coffee and a cookie. Mm -hmm. And the gas man that walked into our house <laughs> without the doors locked. It's just night and day. It's a different world. Mm -hmm. Never locking the doors. Yeah. A lot. Yes. You know, yeah. Even when you went to bed at night, you didn't worry about locking the doors. Oh, we locked it at night, but not during the day. And car keys were locked in the car. All the time. <laughs> during the lock. And board the front door lock. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> We did not wash their feet. <laughs> <laughs> Although, after one Lent, I was so moved, so moved, that I asked a friend if I could wash her feet. Mm -hmm. And she said yes. And I took my little basin and my soap and towels and my Bible, and I went to her house and lotion, and I washed her feet, and she read from her Bible while I was doing that. And mm -hmm. then I thought I was going to go home, and she said, now it's your turn. Oh. oh. And she made me sit oh. and washed mine. Nice. Nice. Very moving. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the home bond would enjoy that. No. Oh, probably not. Because mm -hmm. we do invite people here on Holy Thursday to come up and have your feet washed and then wash the feet of someone else, which it seems we used to have more participation in that pre-COVID and then during COVID we discontinued it and then when we started up again, we still have a fair number of people that come up for it, but not as many as we used to have. That would be good. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. What about hospitality here? Remarkable. Some, yeah. Yes. <laughs> what are some of the things that we do? We, we greet people when they come and, and are generally happy to have them here. Um, and the hospitality after Mass. And I remember just during Mass uh, on my first time here, I mean, I was so welcomed here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think... It comes across as it's warm and genuine. Yes. Effervescing there, whether it's adults or the youth, no matter who it is, they are genuine. Mm -hmm. You feel it. You feel welcome. And you feel like they really enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you sit down at a table, people are welcoming mm -hmm. to you, whether you've been sitting with them before or not. And they're very gracious and talking with you and and that so I think it part of it is <clears throat> you have to be willing to move around you know I mean sometimes it's easier to go sit with the people that you're more familiar with but um, sometimes it's nice to sit down at a table you've never talked with people mm -hmm. and so That's why I like when father always mentions you know if you see a visitor or somebody mm -hmm. you don't yes. know mm -hmm invite them to come in too mm -hmm. because it does show more welcoming 
right when you're asking somebody you don't know opposed to somebody that you do mm -hmm. um, when we do the our father i i always survive myself mm -hmm. and the last few sundays i've gone step back to somebody who else was alone so that we could join hands mm -hmm. very nice, very nice. Mm -hmm. i don't come here that often um as you know the saint stephen's but i'll, I'll drop in and father paul seemed Rec doesn't recognize me, but he recognizes that I'm not typically there. And mm -hmm. so, and I know you get you guys sometimes will give out the loaves of bread. Mm -hmm. And so he 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 made sure he he spotted me and saw me coming out, and he goes, "I have a bread, you know, some bread for you." Mm -hmm. and so I said, "Well, I, I I don't think anybody goes. No, you're taking some bread." <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, he's a foodie. <laughs> it's just nice that yeah, he he kind of recognizes his mm -hmm. flock and he invites mm -hmm. others in. You know. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Well, come Saturday night, you get more than just a loaf of bread. You'll get a great pasta meal. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah we've got our Archbishop coming Saturday. Oh, really? Our, our, um, we um, were not established as a canonical parish when the parish started. Um, our Archbishop Flynn, who's up there, and this room is named for him, started the parish and somehow neglected to file the proper paperwork. <laughs> Uh, oh. So we've been struggling with that for years, and uh, oh. finally, uh, the last goal that, that we had actually set as a parish mm -hmm. a number of years ago was to get to 500 households. So last March, uh, when we hit 500, um, we contacted the archbishop and said, okay, we've met every goal that we've set for ourselves and every goal that you've been holding us to. Uh, it's time now to establish us as a parish. So... He went through all the procedures that need to be done, and um, we uh, met with different uh, groups at the archdiocese and uh, got the call um, on um, October 31st. Well, we, we had gotten the notification that he was approving it, but we got the call on October 31st just what the process was going to be. And... Um, it was with three different people from the archdiocese and um, uh, that they were going to have the archbishop send the letter that said that he would be issuing his decree and i said um, can you i said how significant it is that uh, this is happening now uh, the day before um, all Saints Day because we've been praying to practically every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually had the Archbishop write the letter dated at November 1st and he is, um, they talked about different dates to make it official and his suggestion was to have it March 3rd which is the Feast of St. Catherine Drexel. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought, yeah, that made the most sense. So we originally invited him to be here Sunday um, to celebrate Mass and read the decree, but he um, had a conflict that came up, so they moved it to Saturday. So he'll be for the Saturday Mass, and we've got a, a catered pasta dinner um, with a gluten free pasta for those of, the, of us that can't eat gluten anymore. But um, so it'll be a big dinner with a complimentary bar that the knights are putting on with beer and wine. Big celebration. Know. Come and join us. Mm -hmm. You don't even need to bring your own fork. <laughs> and there is no Thank cost. You. Oh. you come too. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, a long, it's a long way. <laughs> well, um, Saturday Mass will be live streamed. Typically, it's just the Sunday one, but because of the importance, we're live streaming Saturday as well. Well, they, they don't send out the link ahead of time. Just go on, because I've tried to, you know, live stream stuff, and I can't, I don't know where the link is. Well, if you go right to the homepage of the website. Okay. Well, that's where I was looking, but evidently I didn't see the link. It's just hit on, what, mass time or something? Because I know that's what I did the last time. I could not find Saturday. the link. Streamed, are they? Not typically is not. No, but okay. Yeah, there it is. Usually okay. Sunday. Yeah, occasionally, there's a, um, like we're having a baptism at a Saturday mass. We we'll ask the um, parents if they want it live stream because they've got family or friends someplace else that can't be oh, here. Yeah. Um, nice. But otherwise, it's just the Sunday mass. It's live stream. 
Um, let's look at some more of these questions here. <clears throat> Number three, prayerfully reflect on Luke's story of Martha and Mary's encounter with Jesus. And again, this is in Luke's version. With whom do you most identify? Do you allow yourself to enter into the story, listen for what Jesus has to say to you? How will you respond? I I identify with Martha because I, I would be up doing stuff. But I would not go and complain about it. I would just do it. And when I got married later, alone, Yes, then yes. I would do my <laughs> I think so. Then I would come watch out. <laughs> Anybody else? I related with Martha as well. In doing the Bible study, part of me came and thought, okay. You got to look at this a different way because both of them did everything mm -hmm. that they felt was right to do. Yes. Um, and they learned, both of them learned, you know, from uh -huh. that, uh, Martha probably more than, than Mary, which is kind of a natural with that. But um, I, I do believe that in the conversation with Jesus and that, that he kind of made everything okay, but letting them know what's the right, you know, what's the most important as a priority to, you know, to keep the closeness with uh, learning from, from Jesus and listening, even stopping to take a pause, mm -hmm. you know, but we're so busy in our life and that it affects us so much. I, that's kind of why I chose Martha is because I have a tendency to let a lot of small things distract me from what I should really be doing. And such as Jesus suggested, you know, we, we should be praying more. We should be, everything should be involving, we're doing it because of him, not because of our own glory or because of our own whatever. But like I said, I get distracted really easy. Um, I would have been doing the same thing as Martha. I would have been you mm -hmm. know, thinking that I had to do all mm -hmm. this other stuff, thinking that was important, but that's not really what, yeah. mm -hmm. what it is. Along the same lines, it's the same thing. Like even as a as a father, sometimes you know you. I want to. I'm going to work, to provide for my family, and but my kids don't understand that. They only yep. want my time. They only want my attention. Yep. And then I think that's kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and time is so, so important too. Mm -hmm. You know, but from their view, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I was Martha, but I think I did. <laughs> you want to be married? You all grew that? <laughs> I think I did, because cause my sister does such a good job of it. <laughs> Her middle name is actually Martha. Um, in my Bible, it talks about Martha and her strengths and accomplishments, known as a hospitable homemaker, believed in Jesus with growing faith, had a strong desire to do everything exactly right. Well, I was raised that way. Well, weaknesses and mistakes, she expected others to agree with her priorities, was overly concerned with details. My sister has just gone through having to sell a house, and it was overwhelming because she let all the details take over everything. And um, she had to get on meds to get through it. Um, tended to feel sorry for herself when her efforts were not recognized, limited Jesus' power to his life. Lessons from Martha's life. Getting caught up in details can make us forget the main reason for our actions. And there's a proper time to listen to Jesus and a proper time to work for him. That's very good. Question seven. What is your reaction to the intensity of Jesus weeping and being perturbed toward the end of the story of the raising of Lazarus. What does it reveal about Jesus' relationship with Mary and Martha? He was full of compassion and, and felt the hurt that they were that they were feeling. Um, and I think, you know, when they use the word perturbed or whatever, 
Yeah, I think he was probably focusing more on the sins and life and everything that's creating all this mess before him. That's... I think it was showing his humanness too. The fact that he could feel, you know, what was going on there and empathize with them. He loved all three of them deeply. And in my teaching part of my Bible, it said that it showed we have a God who cares. He has deep emotions. He cries. He has compassion, sorrow, indignation, frustration. He was human. We must have a sense of humor to put up with everything that we do. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Let's look at one more question. Nine. In John's story of the anointing of Jesus, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, is described as performing a ritual of hospitality for Jesus. Her actions would have been considered strange, controversial, and extreme. Have you ever witnessed an act of love or hospitality that was considered extreme and shocking at the time? What do you think prompted this radical act, and how did you and others respond? I find it funny. There's always one question I have a hard time coming up with an answer for, and you always choose that one. Yes, yes. yeah, I couldn't answer it either. I, I, well, you just oh. gave it the perfect example of it. <laughs> Calling up your neighbor and their friend, what it was. And... Yep. Okay, okay. That was a long time ago. I could not come up with a thought as far as something shocking or extreme. I didn't come up with anything either. Yeah, I guess you could consider that a strange or <laughs> and extreme. <laughs> My friend put up with me. <laughs> well, she More than that. Is, she obviously enjoyed it and respected you for that. Oh, I think she respected that I wanted to do it. Yes, um, absolutely. That I could come to that. But I was that moved by, by the service that day. I like your suggestion that the, the homebound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know how open they'd be to it, but I think it would be. That would be. Yeah. And if not their feet, even if you take some lotion and massage their right. hands. I mean, yeah, I think they would. Um, yeah, I used to do that for my mother because I had to take care of her. But uh, I, I mean, that's because I wanted to do it. Right. And it wasn't a stranger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kathy, why don't you mention that to uh, Len and Todd and oh, sure just we... suggest it to me. Yep. Any other extreme or shocking signs of hospitality any of you have ever experienced? I'm not sure if this is quite extreme or not, but my, my dad had Parkinson's and so my mom was a caretaker to him and and um and she anytime he had to go to the hospital for anything she stayed overnight and by his side she'd go home for the day and take a shower to do something quickly but it was always by his side at the hospital mm -hmm. and then she went in and then he went into a senior care facility for a little while and she stayed there as well you know and so i mean i see a lot of people who you know, he'll drop their loved ones off and he'll go home and go to sleep and come back in the morning. And I think that's more sensible because you need to have your <laughs> respite in order to have that energy to take care of them during the day. But mm -hmm. she wouldn't leave the side. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was, that was pretty amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, it is. Yeah. And there's so many people in a, um, nursing homes and different things that have no family members that. Mm -hmm that maybe not live nearby or don't see them as often as they'd like. And so you can do volunteer work to go visit them and just sitting there and talking to them mm -hmm. means the world. And taking them for a walk or whatever, bringing pets, 
you know, mm -hmm. they cry because they can attach to some. Yeah. It's easy just yes. to have a pet and trying to, you know, converse with, you know, some of the other residents. Yes. Even residents can have conflicts that they can get into. But yeah, just visiting them it's, means the world. Yeah, I did <clears throat> up in Detroit Lakes, I did uh, most of the ministry to the dying. And a lot of it was at um, the two nursing homes. But the night supervisor at Emmanuel Nursing Home was the mother, a good friend of mine. And frequently I would get a call from her that somebody was dying. And she said, no one should die alone. Can you come in and be with them or not? Right. It's really nice. But, you know, it was those people that either didn't have family or the family didn't want to be part of it or, or further away or... I mean, all kinds of different situations, but like somebody shouldn't just be laying in their own bed and suddenly die and there's nobody there to be with them. Yeah, hospice is amazing. Mm -hmm. They are. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Yes. Any final thoughts, comments, questions, and anything from this lesson or anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about? Having open ears and eyes and just the vision of what we should be doing is listening more and, and taking more time. Um, I was reading a book that talked about even sermons, you know, making notes while you're at Mass and make, you know, and this and that and, and going home and rereading it and looking it up and doing things. And I have to, I have the other thing too I've got is, uh, I don't know if you remember, Arch, what was it, Archbishop? He was on back in the fifties. He was Fulton on Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen. Fulton yes, Sheen. 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 And yeah. While I was yeah. doing errands, doing ironing, I used to really get into watching him. Uh -oh. And one day it was really hot. We had no air conditioning, and I did. I was watching him so much the iron was bright, oh, no. and I had an imprint <laughs> oh, my God. on the iron for a long, oh. long time. But I didn't even feel it. I was so into oh. he was watching him every was day. Wonderful. He was and I, I've got the collection. Do you really? That'll be safe for me to use instead of having an iron around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, next week we do have Mary Magdalene, the non prostitute. Oh, <laughs> um, next week will be a little bit different because the Archdiocese decided to have their labor law seminar Wednesday morning that I am required to attend. So the morning session will be Monday at 10 and the evening session will be at 7, the usual time, Wednesday. But oh, okay. it's the you're coming in the morning or... next week, it'll be Monday morning. Oh, okay. So let's close with the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good week. Okay, Thank so, you. So, so next week, Monday. Yeah, Monday, you're coming to the morning session at 10. And, and that's March. Uh, Oh, it's the fourth, March fourth, okay. ten, or yeah, Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday seven. at seven. Okay, and Wednesday. Can I buy one of these books? The, the um, one? I don't have any left. You could order one, or we could just make copies of the next two lessons. Uh, okay, which are the Thank you for sharing your book. I Thank forgot. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Welcome. This was a very full lesson. Yes. Good, but very full. Sue, so, um, you know, what I liked about that too and is reading through, you know, when Jesus was telling the disciple, you know, that Lazarus was sleeping, you know, and the interpretation, you know, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we take it next week, but I'll be sure to come. And that's the